you have a lesson for us today. And I'd recommend folks go back into the archive too. We had a great one using the Simpsons. Uh, but, you know, I think people are hungry uh, for tools. So let's give them some today and, and I'll, we'll get to it more specifically later, but we'll incorporate some of what's happening in Oakland. We keep touching in with, I mean, your other title, of course, is TMBS West Coast or TMBS Bay. Yeah. So, yeah. so we've got to have it all in. So Joshua, what is the lesson that we're learning today? So just to give some context, I've been a part of a network of nonviolent direct action trainers for about 15 years called the Ruckus Society, which right now is like reignited and all over the country supporting, um, you know, massive numbers of people to maneuver the streets in decentralized ways. And um, I've been doing protest coordination in a variety of movements really since the 90s from movement moments like the global justice moment and different iterations of the post Ferguson stuff or, um, or Occupy and uh, Keystone XL. And there's ways that this moment is substantially different than others. And then uh, there's patterns that it also fits into and lessons I think we can apply. So what I wanna share is not meant to be political strategy for this movement. That's like literally not my role in the movement and not my place. There's um, my relationship to this movement has been one of like offering some tactical solidarity and support. But my hope is that while we can be rooted in what's going on around us right now, um, that it'll also be applicable um, to future uprisings, because I think that we need to anticipate that unrest will continue. Uh, it's not just going to be on this front, but on a variety of fronts. You know, like hunger is staring people in the face right now, and uh, there's going to be more inflection points. Um, some will be predictable, like the election's probably going to be another one, and some of them are not going to be predictable. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about... Uh, the relationship between uprisings and sustained organizing. And because the influx of energy that's happening right now is like a really good fuel. Um, but, you know, it can't sustain you for that long. And at the same time, the best way to balance a bicycle is by being in motion, by pedaling and moving, right? And um, the first thing I want to share is just, it's, it, it's exciting to me to see on social media uh, a lot of, tools and lessons being being shared that are grounding people in the long haul nature of the fight of being like, you know, the freedom rides lasted seven months, Montgomery bus boycott lasted over a year, Greensboro sit-ins lasted six months, that I think people are grounding themselves in not letting this be um, something that happens in the moment and then people go home. Um, and there's a contradiction in these kinds of moments, like a friend of mine who's in an organization in New York just said, uh, told me, we've just had the biggest mass meeting we've ever had since Trump got elected. Uh, and also, uh, it feels like our organization is on the brink of falling apart. And so that's the kind of contradiction that I want to speak to with this lesson. And um, it, I want to start with a framework uh, from an organization called Movement Let, uh, Net Lab that was given to me by one of my wildfire project comrades, Samantha Corbin. Um, David, could you put the graphic up? Thank you. So I'll describe it for people who are uh, listening and, and not watching. Um, think of this graph like the heartbeat of an inflection point of an uprising. So um, the the this is you know COVID might actually change the curve of this, <laughs> ironically, um, because one of the things that's different about these conditions is that um, a lot of organizers don't have to balance their normal jobs with also organizing because they're fucking out of work. <laughs> um, and on the other hand, being out of work is um, really pushing people to uh, the brink that makes things even more chaotic. And so um, I'll describe this curve and then just share some thoughts about where I think we're at in this moment and what it means. Um, so uh, it starts by the, in the first part of this graph, there's just the context. These are the material conditions. This is the enduring crisis uh, that we are in. It's persistent and worsening conditions. And then there's a trigger event. And uh, trigger events are just anything that sparks that tinder. They can be small or they can be big. In this case, it was big. Um, but um, it, the trigger event itself is, is, is only illuminates the, the larger conditions that, that we're in. 
So then there's this huge uptake, right? Where we're in the moment of uprising and that's where we're at now. And there's massive numbers of people get mobilized and they're looking for action. It's also a time where the veils fall away, right? Um, and that eventually gets into the next phase, which is a peak. And it's, it's, you're never clear whether you're in the peak or not. It's not at all clear whether this is the peak, whether this is gonna accelerate further and the peak is gonna be much more dramatic than this. Um, but in the peak, the movement is uh, recognized. It has media penetration. It changes the national conversation. Um, and leaders in the movement are often regarded as having a lot more power. And that's the moment where elites make gestures towards that power, right? They need to find some way to position themselves in relationship to it. After the peak always comes a contraction. Um, and so the contraction can take the form of a backlash, reactionary elements organizing against us, um, a decline in numbers of people in the streets, burnout of key organizers, internal disagreements, infighting. And it's important to anticipate that that's going to come. Um, and I'm gonna speak more about that in a minute. But then the next phase is, is what's called evolution where it builds back up and then the longer term organizing projects take root and either they take advantage of the openings that were made possible by the uprising and drive long-term uh, concrete change uh, or they don't. And um, that, that's the opportunity to really apply and concretize those things. And it's also a moment for within movements to open up reflections, to learn lessons and build and, uh, and really systematize infrastructure to then be in the next phase, which is the new normal, right? Changed conditions. And so when uprisings are not successful and movements can't actually systematize them, these things just happen over and over again in a cycle and the new normal doesn't change that much. Um, I believe we're at a point that is distinct in our lifetimes. Um, I don't just believe that, everyone I know seems to believe that. Um, and in that, th in that context, I wanna just share some lessons that I've learned. Uh, the point of this, this kind of graph is, it's, it's useful to think of it like a, like a heartbeat, right? Or it's like an inhale, exhale. So the line looks a little bit differently every time. You can sustain different parts of it for different amounts of time, but the, the point is not to sustain the peak for as long as possible. It's important to not get confused, the thinking like to confuse the peak moment of uprising for the revolution. <laughs> um, it has an important role to play, but if you try to sustain it, it's one, you can't maintain it forever. And two, um, that's how movements collapse uh, from their own internal contradictions and burnout. And so the last thing I'll say about this particular graphic uh, before we can take it off the screen is that there's actually a whole tool associated with it that allows you to um, map your particular role in the movement's ecosystem. And it gives advice on what should our priorities be during a particular moment based on whether you are doing outreach and absorption or you're doing communications or you're doing support for self-organizing or you're trying to resource it or do healing or relationship building or political education or arts and culture, there's the tool goes through and you can actually locate yourself and the kind of role you're playing and then see based, uh, based on here, what, what is a useful focus, at least from what we've learned in the past. Um, so you could take it off the screen. Thanks, Kristen. Um, what I want to say about the moment we're in right now that feels clear, um, regardless of, uh, you know, the future is very much unwritten, but definitely absorption and onboarding uh, are key and that we're in a moment of a lot of emergent organic self-organizing and that's re there's there's a complicated relationship between the organized left and organic street uprisings partially because so much of the organized left is trapped within the nonprofit industrial complex and so it's really important that you know we value a lot of the infrastructure that we have and we mobilize those resources, but to do it in a way where it's, there's not some kind of external framework being imposed and really letting people lead those organizations in this moment. And um, that brings the organic energy to the forefront because otherwise um, well-intentioned kind of nonprofits can actually unintentionally co-opt and nip the energy in the bud. And at the same time, um, real like we, we need real organizations with real experience to share that experience through mass training, particular tactically, uh, particularly tactical experience, to build infrastructure, to allocate funding for the long haul, to allow movements to take advantage of the attention that they have in the moment of the peak. And that's the moment where you're able to make the most radical and transformative demands, and then everything gets shaped by the flag you kind of stake in the ground there. 
after those moments during the contraction, that's when the infighting always comes. That's and infighting happens for a thousand different reasons about who got media attention and who didn't. Is the movement being represented in this way or that way? How authentic or not is it? That always happens. And the best advice that I would like to share um, is that if you're in an organization, it's really important to, after your actions, after your mobilizations, start having debriefs now. You won't want to. It will seem like there's not time, but it will prevent breakdowns from happening three months from now. You have to learn to give and receive feedback. Otherwise, divisions simmer and fester. You don't learn. People become entrenched in their positions rather than letting this moment teach us and rather be, than being students of our context. And soon we're going to need organizations that know how to serve groups uh, after they start to splinter under the pressure. And that's, that's one thing that, my, that the Wildfire Project does. That's part of why we were founded was to support groups emerging out of crisis to shift into um, long-term sustainability. And the balance between rapid response and long-term infrastructure also... It, like it really matters how we take care of each other, that we need a trauma-informed um, orientation to healing because right now we really are seeing a rupture that is a real opening. And we also need to be honest that the road ahead is going to almost definitely include escalated authoritarianism. And the consequence of that is physical trauma uh, on, uh, that is compounding for the existing trauma that people are experiencing. And if our movements can't hold people in that trauma, our movements get uh, toxified by it. And so um, the, uh, one example of this, of, 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 of this dynamic is um, on one hand, we need to really celebrate the uh, Minneapolis City Council announcing their intention to disband the police and really amplify that as much as possible while we also know that, and this is what you talk about on this show, that in order for that to go in a transformative direction, it's going to take years and years of organizing that is gonna be painstaking and it's going to be, and it's going to include needing to change laws that are actually outside of the jurisdiction of the city council. And so it's going to require a, a different orientation to coalition. And there's also the barriers are going to keep coming up as you get more power. Um, and, you know, the word that I just got from a friend who's an organizer in Minneapolis is that the cops are, are uh, threatening to go on strike as a result of this. And so things are going to get more chaotic. And which is why I think there's, um, and feel free to stop me. I know I'm just kind of going. Is it all right if I keep going? Yeah, great. So it's really important, I think, and this is, you know, we're just in the terrain of me giving my personal experience here. And so um, I, I just want to offer that humbly and in, in context that, you know, our world is changing. But um, it's important to celebrate our victories as much as possible. And there's a careful dialectic here. And I want to actually ally with Matt on a conversation that you guys were just having earlier in the program about um, rhetoric, which is that, you know, it, it, the, the entire public narrative about the role of police is unraveling right now. And in the U.S., our generation, after 45 years of backlash um, and the recent decade of liberals really perfecting their performance, uh, especially with, you know, clown displays like the Democrats, like wearing kente cloth yesterday and all of the, you know, foolishness like that. Um, it's really easy to be cynical of every single gesture or statement that is not material and think that every single one is bullshit. Um, but we don't need to throw cold water on every gesture either. Instead, we can look at it as an indicator of the game shifting. And so what I mean by that is that um, this is what my elders uh, who've been through these mass movement cycles and even participated in revolutionary moments in other countries uh, have told me this week. What they've, what they've hammered home for me is that there's a real, the danger of cynicism is that you put yourself in a bunker of a permanent opposition mentality where if you only ever imagine uh, being in the role of holding someone else with real, pow uh, with real power accountable, then you can't think of yourself as part of a governing coalition. And we need to think of our movements as saying, we want to run the country, which means the left needs to lead everyone, which means we want to lead a coalition that can expect, you know, we can't expect everyone in our coalition to have like, you know, pure revolutionary politics. No revolution in history has led a coalition that everyone in the coalition has agreed with the maximum demands of the revolutionaries within it, right? Um, and so therefore, in order to get a set, get a sense of what a coalition looks like, we need to measure those shifts 
based on where people's previous positions were and how far we're able to move them, which is the spectrum of allies, which was the Simpsons lesson we did before, right? And conditions are changing right now. And um, if you can't imagine yourself as part of a governing coalition, um, then you've already lost, you'll never run the country. And when there was no possibility of winning anything meaningful, because that's the stance we've been in, that's the stance I've been in for most of my life. Then when ruling elites uh, like uh, adopt rhetoric, it's obviously feels meaningless. Um, but now um, we can imagine it as something to build upon and an opportunity to drive a necessary wedge into, which is what Dr. Cornell West was doing in the clip you were playing earlier by calling out co-optation. So um, what I'm saying here is that uh, when we see members of our opposition signaling sympathies, we both need to be vigilant that I'm so glad on this program you're talking about the degree to which those are often psyops because it is propaganda um, and it's, a, it's, it's cynical. It can be co-opting and face saving. Um, and some of it might be sincere. And in many case of those cases, it doesn't matter. What matters is, is it an indicator of the expanding arena of struggle? And so just to be to ground what I'm saying, what I'm talking about in this moment is I'm not talking about the kente cloth stuff. I'm talking about things like Confederate monuments being removed all around the country in Birmingham and Virginia, the Robert E. Lee one. I'm talking about you know New York Times uh, editors demanding that that op-ed guy be fired. I'm talking about U.S. embassies across Africa condemning police murder. Those are symbolic things that I think we can allow ourselves to get excited about, and that's that's the balance: is refusing to settle for anything that's not real and continuing to push, but still allowing ourselves to be inspired by things because some of the spectacles are related to the way we transform consciousness too. Um, and so we have to be able to also imagine some of our opposition changing. And if we, if we can't imagine any of our opposition changing, then like, let me give the most extreme example because you uh, were, were um, posting a picture of your Emile Cartabral book. Um, which is, this is like a high bar, I admit. <laughs> but so for folks who are, you know, not familiar, Emil Cabral, Cape Verdean revolutionary who um, helped organize a revolution in Guinea-Bissau against the occupying Portuguese that was so successful, not only did it um, overthrow those occupying soldiers, but actually so deeply transformed the consciousness of those soldiers that they went home to Portugal and made a revolution there as well. And there's an aspect of that that I think is like, actually pretty amazing spiritual warfare. But the point is that it followed the mechanics of power. These Portuguese soldiers learned these Pan-African, like they learned, like they learned these Pan-African Marxist theories because they were losing and they wanted to understand why they were losing. If they were winning, they wouldn't have read Cabral's like writings in the newspaper. They wouldn't have cared at all. And so when the other side gets pushed back on their heels, um, that's when people start to pay attention, even if they're just trying to recalibrate and retool to maintain their own position, right? And in the process, there's an opportunity to make real shifts there. And so I'm not saying that we should celebrate bullshit. It was also Cabral who said, claim no easy victories. <laughs> and right. so I, I just wanted to thread that particular balance because I, um, I think it's right to be skeptical. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.